President-elect Jimmy Carter and the inaugural party arrive at the White House to be greeted by President Gerald Ford and to enjoy a chat and coffee before preparing to drive to the Capitol. Turning the corner at the Treasury Building, the cavalcade heads down historic Pennsylvania Avenue towards the Capitol. the crowds await in a holiday mood for the arrival of the inaugural party and the start of the ceremonies marking the change of administrations. Members of the House of Representatives lead the parade of dignitaries through the rotunda onto the inaugural stand. The mace is carried by D. Thomas Iorio of the Office of the Sergeant at Arms of the House. Members of the Senate arrive on the stand, headed by Senator James O. Eastland of Mississippi. President Pro Tem of the Senate. Members of the family of the president-elect come in. Former vice president and now senator and Mrs. Hubert H. Humphrey of Minnesota are welcomed. The diplomatic corps files onto the stand, headed by chief of protocol, Mrs. Shirley Temple Black and escorted by Ms. Peggy L. Parrish, Assistant Executive Director of the Joint Congressional Inaugural Committee. The mother of the President-elect, Mrs. Lillian Cotter, arrives. The soon-to-be members of the cabinet are next, escorted by Chester B. Sobsey, administrative assistant to Senator Howard W. Cannon of Nevada, chairman of the Joint Congressional Committee on Inaugural Ceremonies. of the Supreme Court are escorted to the presidential stand by Chester H. Smith, Chief Counsel of the Committee on Rules and Administration of the Senate. Billy Carter, brother to the president-elect, arrives. The wives of President Ford and Vice President Rockefeller make their entrance, escorted by Mrs. Thomas P. O'Neill, Jr., wife of the Speaker of the House. 
Mrs. Jimmy Carter and Mrs. Walter F. Mondale come on to the stand, escorted by Mrs. Howard W. Cannon, wife of the chairman of the Congressional Inaugural Committee. President Ford and Vice President Rockefeller make their entrances, accompanied by Senator Mark O. Hatfield of Oregon and House Minority Leader John J. Rhodes of Arizona, both members of the Congressional Inaugural Committee, and escorted by Larry E. Smith, Minority Staff Director of the Senate Rules Committee, and Robert C. Huff and Elwin G. Radin, Deputy Sergeants at Arms of the Senate and House, respectively. President-elect Walter F. Mondale arrives, accompanied by Senator Robert C. Byrd of West Virginia, Majority Whip of the Senate, and Representative James Wright of Texas, both members of the Congressional Inaugural Committee, and escorted by Sergeants at Arms F. Naughty Hoffman and Kenneth R. Harding of the Senate and House, respectively. President-elect Carter prepares to enter the inaugural stand, accompanied by members of the Joint Congressional Committee on Inaugural Ceremonies, headed by Chairman Howard W. Cannon of Nevada, and escorted by William McWhirter Cochran, Executive Director of the Congressional Inaugural Committee, and the Sergeants at Arms of the Senate and House. Senator Cannon opens the ceremony. Mr. President, Mr. President-elect, Mr. Vice President, Mr. Vice President-elect, distinguished guests and fellow citizens, in the highest tradition of our form of government, we are here today to inaugurate the 39th President of the United States. It is a great honor for me, it is a great honor for me as chairman of the Joint Congressional Committee on Inaugural Ceremonies to begin our program by presenting the United States Marine Band under the direction of Lieutenant Colonel Jack T. Klein, which will play America the Beautiful.
For our invocation, I present Bishop William R. Cannon of the United Methodist Church, Atlanta, Georgia. Will you please stand? Let us pray. O oh God, whom people of different persuasion, yet on whom we all alike rely for our lives, our land, and the opportunity for happiness, grant us, we pray thee, a new and vital realization of thy sovereignty and our dependence, of what it means to be creatures responsible to their creator, and of our obligations both as individuals. Make our people governable, O oh God, Save our nation from factionalism and from the divisiveness of those who exert pressure on government for their own interests, seeking selfish gain more than the common good. Make us, we pray, one people unto thee, united for the good of the nation and for the service of the world. Help us together to build a nation here on earth and in its, that in its manner of life anticipates thine everlasting kingdom in heaven. All this we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, thy Son and our Savior. Amen. We will now have the pleasure of hearing the Battle Hymn of the Republic, sung by selected voices from Atlanta University, Clark, Morehouse, Morris Brown, and Spelman Colleges, and the Interdenominational Theological Center. This chorus is conducted by Dr. Wendell P. Whelum and will be accompanied by the United States Marine Band. The Speaker of the House of Representatives, the Honorable Thomas P. O'Neill, Jr., will now administer the oath of office to the Vice President-elect. <coughs> Walter F. Mondale, citizen of the state of Minnesota, duly elected Vice President of the United States, are you ready to take that oath of office? I am. Will you please repeat after me? I, Walter F. Mondale, solemnly swear. I, Walter F. Mondale, solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Against all enemies, foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That will, I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without mental reservation or purpose of evasion. Without mental reservation or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. That I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties of the office which I am about to enter. The duties of the office which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Thank you. Thank you. 
My fellow citizens, I present the distinguished Chief Justice of the United States, the Honorable Warren Earl Berger, who will administer the oath of office to the President-elect. Are you prepared to take the constitutional oath? I am. Would you place your left hand on the Bible and raise your right hand and repeat after me? I, Jimmy Carter, do solemnly swear. I, Jimmy Carter, do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The office of President of the United States. The office of President of the United States. And will, to the best of my ability, and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend, preserve, protect, and defend, the Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, the President of the United States. For myself and for our nation, I want to thank my predecessor for all he has done to heal our land. In this outward and physical ceremony, we attest once again to the inner and spiritual strength of our nation. As my high school teacher, Miss Judy Coleman, used to say, we must adjust to changing times and still hold to unchanging principles. Here before me, is the Bible used in the inauguration of our first president in 1789. And I have just taken the oath of office on the Bible my mother gave me just a few years ago, open to a timeless admonition from the ancient prophet Micah. He has showed thee, O man, 
but is good. And what does the Lord require of thee but to do justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with thy God? This inauguration ceremony marks a new beginning, a new dedication within our government, and a new spirit among us all. A president may sense and proclaim that new spirit, but only a people can provide it. Two centuries ago, our nation's birth was a milestone in the long quest for freedom. But the bold and brilliant dream which excited the founders of this nation still awaits its consummation. I have no new dream to set forth today, but rather urge a fresh faith in the old dream. Ours was the first society openly to define itself in terms of both spirituality and human liberty. It is that unique self-definition which has given us an exceptional appeal. But it also imposes on us a special obligation to take on those moral duties which, when assumed, seem invariably to be in our own best interest. You have given me a great responsibility to stay close to you, to be worthy of you, and to exemplify what you are. Let us create together a new national spirit of unity and trust. Your strength can compensate for my weakness, and your wisdom can help to minimize my mistakes. Let us learn together and laugh together and work together and pray together, confident that in the end we will triumph together in the right. The American dream The American dream endures. We must once again have full faith in our country and in one another. I believe America can be better. We can be even stronger than before. Let our recent mistakes bring a resurgent commitment to the basic principles of our nation, for we know that if we despise our own government, we have no future. We recall in special times when we have stood briefly but magnificently united. In those times, no prize was beyond our grasp. But we cannot dwell upon remembered glory. We cannot afford to drift we reject the prospect of failure or mediocrity or an inferior quality of life for any person. Our government must at the same time be both competent and compassionate. We have already found a high degree of personal liberty and we are now struggling to enhance equality of opportunity. Our commitment to human rights must be absolute. Our laws fair, our natural beauty preserve. The powerful must not persecute the weak, and human dignity must be enhanced. We have learned that more is not necessarily better. 
that even our great nation has its recognized limits and that we can neither answer all questions nor solve all problems. We cannot afford to do everything, nor can we afford to lack boldness as we meet the future. So together, in a spirit of individual sacrifice for the common good, we must simply do our best. Our nation can be strong abroad only if it is strong at home. And we know that the best way to enhance freedom in other lands is to demonstrate here that our democratic system is worthy of emulation. To be true to ourselves, we must be true to others. We will not behave in foreign places so as to violate our rules and standards here at home. For we know that the trust which our nation earns is essential to our strength. The world itself is now dominated by a new spirit. Peoples more numerous and more politically aware are craving and now demanding their place in the sun, not just for the benefit of their own physical condition, but for basic human rights. The passion for freedom is on the rise. Tapping this new spirit, there can be no nobler, nor more ambitious path for America to undertake on this day of a new beginning than to help shape a just and peaceful world that is truly humane. We are a strong nation and we will maintain strength so sufficient that it need not be proven in combat. A quiet strength based A quiet strength based not merely on the size of an arsenal, but on the nobility of ideas. We will be ever vigilant and never vulnerable. And we will fight our wars against poverty, ignorance, and injustice. for those other enemies against which our forces can be honorably marshaled. We are a proudly idealistic nation, but let no one confuse our idealism with weakness. Because we are free, we can never be indifferent to the fate of freedom elsewhere. Our moral sense dictates a clear-cut preference for those societies which share with us an abiding respect for individual human rights. We do not seek to intimidate, but it is clear that a world which others can dominate with impunity would be inhospitable to decency and a threat to the well-being of all people. The world is still engaged in a massive armaments race designed to ensure continuing equivalent strength among potential adversaries. We pledge perseverance and wisdom in our efforts to limit the world's armament to those necessary for each nation on domestic safety. And we will move this year a step toward our ultimate goal, the elimination of all nuclear weapons from this earth. We 
we urge all of the people to join us for success can mean life instead of death. Within us, the people of the United States, there is evidence a serious and purposeful rekindling of confidence. And I join in the hope that when my time as your president has ended, people might say this about our nation, that we had remembered the words of Micah and renewed our search for humility, mercy, and justice, that we had torn down the barriers that separated those of different race and region and religion, and where there had been mistrust, built unity with a respect for diversity, that we had found productive work for those able to perform it, that we had strengthened the American family, which is the basis of our society, that we had ensured respect for the law and equal treatment under the law for the weak and the powerful, for the rich and the poor, and that we had enabled our people to be proud of their own government once again. I would hope I would hope that the nations of the world might say that we had built a lasting peace based not on weapons of war, but on international policies which reflect our own most precious values. These are not just my goals, and they will not be my accomplishments but the affirmation of our nation's continuing moral strength and our belief in an undiminished, ever-expanding American dream. Thank you very much. Benediction will be offered by the Most Reverend John R. Roach, Archbishop of St. Paul in Minneapolis, Minnesota. May we join in prayer. God our Father, we thank you now for this earth, for its fertility and strength, for the green hills, the windy plains, the pounding of the sea and mountain forests, for the Earth's resources and its fragile beauty. We thank you for the gift of life. May we reverence it and protect it. We thank you for the gift of peace. Watch over the leaders of this Earth. Give them hearts for compassion and the fire of freedom. Give them the courage to speak out and to listen quietly. Give them the humility of sincere faith and the vision of future good. And especially today, we ask you to watch over our new leaders, set them upon the right way. 
For you are the Lord in whom we trust. You are the God of our faith. To you be praise and glory forever and ever. Amen. So proud. I will keep you my friend. Congratulations. Give me your ear. Concluding the program, the national anthem will be sung by cantor Isaac Goodfriend of Atlanta, Georgia, accompanied by the United States Marine Band. ceremonies are over and are now a part of history. The new president and vice president and members of their families prepare to retire to the Capitol for a light luncheon. President and Mrs. Carter leave the Capitol to join the official inaugural parade. President and Mrs. Mondale depart behind the president.
And now, on with the parade. The Grand Marshal of the 1977 Presidential Inaugural Parade is Senator Hubert H. Humphrey of Minnesota, who leads off the parade on Pennsylvania Avenue, followed by members of the President's Cabinet and other dignitaries of government. The presidential escort is the military contingent representing all the armed services. and his family surprise and delight everyone by walking the parade route down Pennsylvania Avenue up to the presidential reviewing stand in front of the White House. Vice President and Mrs. Mondale wave to the crowd as they pass by. The next unit in the parade consists of the mass flags of the states and territories of the United States carried by members of the armed forces. band, followed by four segments of the Army, the Active Army, the Military Academy, the Army Reserves, and the National Guard. The America's High School Band of America's Georgia, especially requested by President Carter to represent the Carter home area.
The theme float. A new spirit, a new commitment, a new America is expressed in the reflected faces of the crowds lining the parade route. University of Georgia Band. The Georgia theme float. Tomorrow, together. Steam fire engine number 18 of the DC Fire Department's Museum. It was in use at the beginning of this century. The Culver Black Horse Troop presenting 64 authenticated revolutionary flags and the national colors. This is the eighth time this 90 horse unit has participated in the inaugural parade coming from the Culver Military Academy in Indiana. The Shippensburg State College Band from Pennsylvania. The Montana State Float features members of the Crow Indian Tribe. New Jersey, the Garden State, sent the Toms River High School South Band, Marching Indians, to the inaugural parade. Leading off the second division is the United States Marines with the Marine Band, Marching Units, Color Guard, and Reserve Company. A bit of South Pacific culture is brought by American Samoa as they present a sample of early Samoan transportation in the form of double outrigger canoes. The United States Army Mounted Color Guard from Fort Carson, Colorado, the last authentic horse cavalry platoon in the United States Army, followed by the Virginia Polytech Regimental Band and the Virginia Military Institute Marching Unit. The United States Navy heads the third division of the inaugural parade. The midshipmen are from the United States Naval Academy, where President Carter graduated with a class of 1947. The Navy contingent comprises marching units, color guard, Navy band, and reserve units as well. A national champion high school band from Whitehall, Yearling High School in Whitehall, Ohio. Mississippi's entry displays the diversity and growth of modern Mississippi. The Air Force contingent heads up the 4th Division and is represented by the various facets of the Air Force the Academy, the Air Force Band, the Reserves, and the National Guard.
Sporting entertainers from Opryland, USA. Starring in the Kentucky float is Colonel Holland Sanders of fried chicken fame. Peanut Brigade that sent the Jimmy Carter for President campaign off to a good start joins in the inaugural fun. The unit represents the hundreds of people who crisscross the country in the primaries to tell about Jimmy Carter. Little bags of peanuts are tossed to the crowds. States of America in our 201st year as a nation. 